Our Hebrew scripture lesson for this morning comes to us from the 35th chapter of the book of the prophet Isaiah. This is our lectionary Hebrew scripture passage for today, and we are continuing through the Ark of Isaiah along our Advent journey. So hear now these surprising words. The wilderness and the dry land shall be glad. The desert shall rejoice and blossom. Like the crocus, it shall blossom abundantly and rejoice with joy and singing. The glory of Lebanon shall be given to it, the majesty of Carmel and Sharon. They shall see the glory of the Lord, the majesty of our God. Strengthen the weak hands, make firm the feeble knees, Say to those who are of a fearful heart, be strong, do not fear. Here is your God. God will come with vengeance, with terrible recompense. God will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind shall be open and the ears of the deaf unstopped. The lame shall leap like a deer and the tongue of the speechless sing for joy. For waters shall break forth in the wilderness and streams in the desert. The burning sand shall become a pool, the thirsty ground springs of water. The haunt of jackals shall become a swamp. The grass shall become reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there and it shall be called the holy way. The unclean shall not travel in it, but it shall be for God's people. No traveler, no traveler, not even fools, shall go astray. No lion shall be there, nor any ravenous beast come upon it. They shall not be found there. But the redeemed shall walk there. The ransomed of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, Everlasting joy shall be upon their lips. They shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing will flee away. This is the word of our God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we give you thanks for your surprising promises woven throughout all scripture. The promise that you are with us always. The promise that you bring new life even in the most surprising and desolate of places. We know that you are with us now, so help us to draw near to you. Open our eyes and ears and hearts and minds, all of our senses, to your word for us. And may the word of, words of my mouth and the meditation on all of our hearts be acceptable to you, O oh God. For you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The Atacama Desert in the northern region of Chile is the oldest and driest desert on earth. Now in this desert, there are places where there has been no reported rainfall for more than 400 years. I'm not sure how the rainfall was recorded before that, but at least 400 years. It is a land that scientists have identified on Earth as being a land as dry as Mars. Yet, on a spider web covering the entrance of a cave facing the Pacific Ocean, astrobiologist Armando Azua Bustos discovered a new microalgae growing against the odds. So this microalgae had to have learned that in order to carry photosynthesis in the coast of the driest desert of the earth, they could use spider webs covered with the morning's dew. And in a cave not so far from there, about 15 miles away, he discovered another microalgae too. One that lived off of ocean mist in the bottom of a cave, 
using one-tenth the percentage of sunlight that most plants need to grow. All right, I know I'm talking microalgae, but this is exciting news, friends. And in our text for this morning, Isaiah takes us to a dry, dry desert as well. And he speaks a poetic word once more of new life, unexpect, unexpected life, blossoming up out of dry places, where there was desolation, death, hopelessness, despair, there is life. There is growth. There is possibility. Surprise, the prophet cries. Something amazing is happening. Just when you least expect it, right where you cannot imagine it, God is at work. Do you see it? God is making a way out of no way, just as God always does. This element of surprise is woven into the text itself for today. And some commentators have pointed out that surprise is actually found in the location of this passage in Scripture. Chapter 35 of Isaiah, the 10 verses I read this morning, is a small chapter sandwiched between the language of devastating destruction in Isaiah 34. And then on the other side in Isaiah 36, a story of political upheaval. The verses for today's lectionary, like that flower blossoming up in the middle of the dry desert, are out of place. They also pop up out of nowhere, shouting surprise at the reader, here I am with a promise of hope in dry places. Scholars even wonder how this chapter got where it is. They wonder who penned it and why it landed in this place. And one commentator writes this. Some say that this hopeful promise belongs to second Isaiah. Others argue it comes even later, 6th century BCE or later still, even surely after the exile. This poem comes too early. Who has moved it, they wonder. Some things even our best scholarship cannot explain. But she goes on to say, the spirit hovered over the text and over the scribes. Put it here, breathed the spirit, before anyone is ready. Interrupt the narrative of despair. So here it is. A word that couldn't wait until it might make more sense. Into a world where not much is making sense to a people whose context of exile and destruction is upside down, this prophetic book offers these words of hope. That even in exile and insecurity and despair, the land itself is crying out in gladness. Because God has not forgotten God's people. God is at work bringing new life still. The crocus sings. And the singing land knows already that it will be the pathway for God's remnant to return home again. The land cries out in joy, knowing that joy will cover the heads, creating shelter for God's people. Joy will watch over them, pour out from them in song. Songs of joy are inevitable. The dry land itself will be the path of liberation, of renewal, of new life. Not one person, not even fools, did you hear that in the scripture? Not even a fool can get lost. No one will grow tired or sad or frustrated. No one will get hurt. The joy of God's people will be everlasting. 
This Advent season reminds us again and again that we worship a God who continues to defy our expectations, even our most reasoned ones. Flowers grow where there is no water. Lie and step back and let travelers safely pass by. And God enters humanity as a baby, born to a poor, unwed girl, the instrument of God's salvation to the world. This is what God does. See, we think the world works one way, and we're even quite sure of it. We've categorized every circumstance we can imagine as possible, impossible, to be determined, but unlikely. And God disrupts our expectations, redefines what's possible. God gives us a reason, even when the odds of the world are stacked against us, to burst into song. Now, I don't know about you, but most days I awaken to a new day, and I start living out a script that I didn't even realize I had written. It is a script that has been forged from expectation. Now, see, I've learned from experience what is likely to happen, and I orient my day to that. I plan for it to take a few tries to wake my child up from bed in the morning. I have grown accustomed to the strength of the coffee my husband brews, and I know that a cup and a half is about the right amount to start the day. I I'm not surprised when my sister calls to say good morning on her way into work, and I anticipate that my own workday will contain a dynamic blend of pre-scheduled activities and unscheduled meetings. Without even realizing it, I have accommodated my own expectations. I've made a story formed of expectations I have of those around me and the world at large, and even of myself, and dare I say, even God. Without even noticing, I've started living in a world of my own creation, where possibility is limited by my own imagination and limited expectation, by my own fears and biases, and by my own very small sense of all that is possible. But this third Sunday of Advent invites us to challenge our own expectation, to get our heads out of this dry desert sand, so to speak, and dare to notice the surprising ways that God is showing up in the world. God's initiative is pregnant with possibility, with joy, with new life. And the message is clear. It's consistent the God of Scripture from beginning to end is a God who consistently defies expectation. God brings peace where there was war, friendship where we look for enemy. God removes every obstacle to reconciliation, extending gracious forgiveness, redeeming us through unmerited grace. God straightens up the path for us to find our way home. And what's more, as Mary sings in her Magnificat, God topples political and societal hierarchies, welcomes the outcast, eats with sinners and women and tax collectors, sets a banquet table for all the world has ignored, and says, come to me, all of you who are weary and heavy laden, I'm with you. I'll give you rest and defying all expectation. God takes on human flesh. The Messiah, born a child of unwed refugees, born in a stable among animals and laying in a manger crib. Scripture tells us the story over and over again of a God who continually upends our expectation ushers in possibility, and gives us reason after reason to be filled with joy. One of my favorite hymns uses this line, Life is hallowed by the knowledge God has been this way before. This is how God is. 
into a world that has grown tired of fake news and bipartisan stalemates, inflation, war, exhaustion, racism, sexism, heterosexism, illness, pandemic, all of the things that wear us down. God says over and over, don't worry, I'm here. And something new and beautiful can bloom even here. God is constantly birthing new life, new possibility, new hope. Can you sense it? The prophets call to us in loud voices. They tell us to get ready. They disrupt our day to day and tell us to put down our cell phones and turn off Netflix, set down the to-do list, remove the distractions, take a deep breath. Just focus, focus so that you, so, so that we might, might find the smallest, most impossible location for hope and then fix your attention there. Look into the desolation, the hopelessness, the dryness and expect to see new life start blooming there. Now, as lovely as this sounds, I know it's hard to spot. Our eyes are not trained to see it. And so we have to go about the sacred work of shifting our expectations so that we will notice a God who is with us still. We have to somehow find the courage to believe that God not only can do this, but does again and again in our world, in our time, in our lives. And we have to be open to the fact that often the way forward that is mapped out by God is a route that will take us to territory that we have already decided was far off course, uncharted terrain, but we must trust that God's presence precedes us there. And that in fact, the place to which God is calling us is already crying out in joy. Pay attention, the prophet cries out, get ready. God is up to something new. And so this Advent season, we are invited to ask of ourselves, what is it that we expect? Are there aspects of our lives that have fallen into routine, routine so predictable that we've become numb to divine surprise? Are there parts of our lives that are so hectic or troubling or challenging that we simply cannot find the bandwidth to notice a flower growing in a forgotten ground. Is life already too full that it's impossible to figure out what we need to let go of to make room for something new that God is doing? Ask yourself, what do you expect? I had a realization a few weeks ago as my child and I were sitting at our kitchen table reading the red words for the week. I realized that my child actually wakes up, I mean, albeit after a few shakes of the bed to say it's time to get up, but he wakes up every day expecting to learn something new. He trusts it. He looks forward to it. He knows that every day he will put on his school clothes and head out the door and learn something he did not know before. He might be able to read a new word or notice a new pattern. He might have mastered the language to a new song or dance. He might learn a tradition of a culture that is different than his own. He wakes up every morning not knowing what he will learn, but trusting 
that something new will change him, will inform him, will bless him with a skill that will allow him to engage the world in which he lives in new ways. And so he heads out in the world ready for it, open to that, for that surprising new gift that awaits. It made me notice how much I take for granted, how dulled my perspective is to new possibility that is out there. And as Christ calls us to approach the world through the perspective of a child, I thought, oh, this might be part of what he means. To be attuned to newness and wonder and possibility and an invitation that there's something out there that will change me and this world too. See, the voice of the prophet calls us to a posture of expectancy and awe, where we are so ready to encounter God in new ways that we go looking for new life on cobwebs stretched over caves in the driest desert on earth. We go looking for it. The prophet invites us to use our senses to anticipate with childlike wonder the work of a God who grows gardens in the desert, who sets captives free, who loves the unlovable, who forgives our sins, and who makes all things, even us, new. May we approach this Advent season in a spirit of sacred wonder, expecting that we too will encounter a God of surprise, a God of new life, a God of love. And may we together sing with joy. Amen.